Well, good morning again. <laughs> good to see you all and so many exciting things that we have happening and are about to take place here. So as you remember all of those, also be in prayer for them that we were praying this morning uh, before as we were in our time of worship uh, rehearsal that every time we come together, Lord, let there be souls that are saved. Every time we come together as a life source family. So be in prayer for those things. And I just want to say first and foremost to uh, our lead pastors, Pastor Mike and to Pastor Becky McDermott. I know you guys are watching. Thank you for this great opportunity to bring the word of the Lord. Today, I do not take it lightly, but I count it a great privilege and appreciate uh, them giving me this opportunity. Aren't we thankful for our lead pastors? And all that God is doing in them. Be in prayer for them and the staff as we just continue to move forward and follow the vision that uh, the Lord has placed within them for us to do. And I want to take just a moment and certainly give a big shout out to my beautiful, gorgeous, wonderful, not just my better half, but the best half of me, my wife, Charmaine Bridgman, sitting right over here. And uh, I just, you know, I, I, I love when I get to brag on her. And what I love most is she doesn't have to wait until I have a microphone and standing in front of you to brag on her. But I let her know that she is a wonderful, wonderful mom. She's an incredible wife. She is a wonderful cook and just all the things. And most of all, uh, she loves God with all of her heart. And I think that we could all agree that uh, she is such an anointed worshiper and an anointed singer. And so I love you. Thank you. Thank you. So today we're going to spend just a little time together and talking about the fact that God is good. If I were to say, which I'm about to say, God is good all the time. Right. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. I love that. I love it. I call that one of our churchisms. I don't even know if that's a word, but I just made it up. Now it's a word because I made it up. It's one of our churchisms. It's one of those things that we as believers love to uh, just say to each other on any occasion. You know, if someone were to ask you sometimes, well, how's it going? And you know, you might be kind of going through a little something, but you just say God is good all the time. And then they'll say Okay, you guys had your Wheaties. Y'all did not. All right. So, and it's one of those things that we say, we just say it. And, and you know what? I like it because it really encourages our faith. It just reminds us of who God is. But you know what's even more important is that really is a true statement verbatim from the word of God. And I want us to look at it right now. Just this really short verse, but a powerful one found in Psalm 119, verse 68. And it says this, you are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. I love that those two, y'all can just leave that scripture up there for right now. I love that those two uh, statements, in, though they are independent in thought, that they're there together in one verse. Because you are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. In other words, the psalmist is saying you are good and you do good. And now take me on a journey to see how that works out and how that comes to pass in my life. So I want us to all read it out loud together. Let's go. Ready? Read. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Heavenly Father, we love you today. So thankful that we are here. Thank you for blessing us to have life in our bodies, breath in our lungs, to be here to worship you and to honor you and to glorify you for who you are. God, we thank you that you have given us the most precious gift of your word today. And Lord, as we dive into your word, Holy Spirit, I ask you to lead and guide us. I ask you to speak through me. Help me to say what you want me to say and not to say what you don't want me to say, but that you will be lifted high and exalted in our time together today, Father, and let lives and hearts and families and marriages be healed and strengthened and delivered. Let those who need Jesus as their Savior come to him today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. God is good. 
And I want us to take just a look at the screen real quick. Thank you, media team, for having that up there. So we're going to start off this morning. I know some of you thought, many of you thought, whoo, school is over. I'm done with that. Well, we're going to start with a multiple choice question today. <laughs> take you back to school a little bit. I don't know if I'm the only one, but I loved when they had those multiple choice questions. Because when they would have the ones where it would ask you the question and then it was just the, the, the question mark or then it would have that long blank line that you're supposed to fill in and you know that you really didn't study like you should have and you're like, uh-oh, oh Lord, what are we going to do? But then when you moved on down the test paper, there was that multiple choice question. <laughs> so it would, would kind of get your gears going. And so I want us to look at this, look at this together and I want us actually to read it out loud together. So the statement is God is good. And A says, B, C, D. Now, which one do you think is the right answer? Hey, man, you all moved to the front of the class. Praise God. If you did not choose D, that's okay because these altars stay open the whole time we're here. So you can just come and pray through until you get the right answer. Yes, D. Now, there are times in life where it feels like he's good some of the time. It's like he's good most of the time. Well, at least 99% of the time. But the truth is God is good all the time. Come on, y'all. And God does good all of the time, right? So this is what I want to spend just the next few minutes that we have together just talking about. And I will tell you this, much like the world famous American actress Elizabeth Taylor said to her eighth husband, I won't keep you long. Say, I let that settle in, then y'all, y'all get it. Y'all get it. Y'all get it. Okay. <laughs> Let's look at Psalm 119, uh, verse 68 again. It says, you are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. And you know, sometimes we'll have statements that uh, some, one of our pastors or someone who's uh, speaking uh, on a Sunday that will make a statement that really is just one of those impactful things. And Pastor Mike has just encouraged us to, to, when that happens, put it as a reminder in your phone so that you don't forget it. I remember, as a matter of fact, I was thinking about it this morning when we were singing the song, We Praise You, We'll See You Break Down Every Wall, We'll Watch the Giants Fall. And I remember one particular Sunday when God just really yeah. kept sending that message, Giants Fall, Giants Fall, and he told us to put it in our phone. And I want to encourage you to take this scripture and put it as a daily reminder in your phone because as you're on this journey of learning his statutes or learning his ways and you're going to find yourself in places that you never thought you would find yourself you're going to need to be reminded that it says you are good and do good teach me your statutes did you know that there are over 60 verses in the bible just alone that talk about the goodness of god the talk about God is good and, and reference how his goodness fills the earth and how his goodness uh, fills our lives. And I want to take just a few moments right here and I'm going to breeze through these scriptures. I'm not going to read all 60 of them, but I'm going to read some and, and I don't, don't worry about trying to keep up with them. But I just want to I just want to get our minds focused and, and, and remind us and encourage us about the goodness of God. You guys ready? Y'all ready? Amen. All right. Psalm 104 and 5. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. Yes. Psalm 23, 6. You guys can say this one without me. Surely shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Listen to this. Psalm 107, 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his loving kindness is everlasting. Hallelujah. Psalm 145, 9. The Lord is good Hallelujah. to all. Yes. And his tender mercies are over all his work. Hallelujah. You need to know that because you are his work. Hallelujah. And over your life and surrounding your life. Even when it doesn't feel like it. Even when it's like you can't see it. His tender mercies are over you. Mark 10, 18, Jesus said, not one, no one is good. No one is good, but one. And that is God. Hallelujah. 
Psalm 27, 13, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Anybody ever been there? Matthew 7, 11, Jesus says, if you then being evil, in other words, if you then being of this human nature, which most of the time has a tendency to think more about itself than anyone else. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, say how much more, will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Psalm 34, 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Psalm 107, 8, 9. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul, listen at this, and fills the hungry soul with goodness. That's how good God is. God is good and he does good. Look at what incredible things can happen, will happen when we together proclaim how good God is when we're in worship, much like we just did. Second uh, Chronicles 5, 13 and 14. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voices with the trumpets and the cymbals and all the instruments of music and praised God saying... For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not even continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. It is a powerful thing when you and I will proclaim and declare that God is good all the time and God is good. When we tell him, when we brag on him like that, he shows up and he does amazing things, miraculous things. This is a verse that um, a friend of mine many years ago uh, gave to me. And I just, it, it was so uh, impactful for me then and still is today. And it's Nahum chapter one, verse seven. Yes, I said Nahum. And it is a book in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. I want you to go home and look it up. N-A-H-U-M. Nahum. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 7. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. Look, we could go home right after that. Honestly, when you think about that. He's a stronghold, a stronghold, a steady fortress in the day of trouble. We need to know that because we're going to face trouble. While we're on this side of living, on this natural side, we're going to face trouble. But he is a stronghold in that day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in God. Him. I don't know about you, but I feel encouraged now that we've read all those scriptures and just been reminded of God's goodness. And I want us to take just a quick look at, at what does that word good mean? Now, there are, are several definitions that go in because, you know, we use that word a lot. Yeah, the food was good. Oh, yeah, it was a good movie. So we use it in so many different ways. But I want to concentrate on three definitions that really are applicable to what we're talking about today. Number one, <clears throat> what does the word good mean? It's of highest quality, of the highest worth. Does that sound like our God? Yes. Of reliability. Yes. Number two, it's a favorable character. Uh -huh. Woo! See, I'm excited because I know where I'm going. You don't know yet, but I'm excited because I know where we're going. A favorable character or tendency. And I, 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 that, that stood out to me when I said or tendency. So I looked that word up. And tendency is a proneness to, to go a certain way or to act a certain way or to think a certain way. So in other words, when someone has a tendency, when you and I have a tendency to, <clears throat> to say something or, or to think something, it's because that's, that's in our nature. So we, are, we have a tendency, we have a 
bend to go that way. And we're going to look here in just a minute about what God's bend or tendency is towards us. Number three, the word good means virtuous or beneficial. So when we look at that of highest quality, of highest worth, of reliability, of favorable character or tendency, of of virtuous or or beneficial, then we can see if we think back over all those verses that we just read, that clearly the Bible supports that God really is good and he does good. Amen. So according to this definition, we see that, but it's so much more than that. And if we can take just a few moments and just dive into that a little bit. Number one, he shows his highest quality, his highest worth and reliability toward towards us as our savior. Ephesians 2, 4 says, but God, I love this, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when, somebody say, even when, even when when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace. Somebody shout grace. Grace. By grace, you have been saved. He shows us his highest quality, his highest worth, his reliability towards us as our redeemer. Psalm 107 2 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. When you and I were living without Christ, we were slaves to the devil. We did what he said to do. Our flesh followed him and it was something we could not get ourselves out of. How do I know that? Because we just read in Ephesians 2 that we were dead in our trespasses because we were bound to him. But God who is rich in mercy sent Jesus to redeem us from the hand of the enemy. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hallelujah. He shows us his highest quality, his highest worth, his reliability as our deliverers. Isaiah 41 10 says, fear not. Come on, just say that. Say fear not. not. Hear the Lord saying that to you. Fear not. not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you. With my righteous right hand. Anybody thankful for that today? Number two, he shows us his favorable character and tendency towards us as our good shepherd. John chapter 10, 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. How could we ever have a better shepherd than one willing to die for us? And he did. And then he got up with all power so that we could be raised to life in him. Number two, he shows us that as our life giver. John 10, 10, Jesus says this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy. And this is a little side note that I want to add in here. If you are being asked by those who might be in your life, be it friends or family, or whatever situation you might find yourself in, and you're wondering, well, I don't know if I should do this, if I shouldn't, is this God, is it not? Let me tell you how you'll know it's not God, it's not Jesus. If it's something that's going to steal from you, if it is something that is going to destroy you, if it's something that could ultimately kill you, run away that is not from the Lord because Jesus says I came that you may have and enjoy life we got to get back to enjoying life y'all we got to get back to enjoying it because Jesus came that we would enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows till it overflows. Number three, he shows us his favorable character and his tendency towards us as the merciful one. I love that. I want to give a little background before I read this actual verse, but it's Exodus 34, six. And right, right before this verse, right before this encounter that Moses has with God, 
the Lord has raised Moses up to be the leader of the, of the children of Israel who had been in bondage for over 400 years. In Egypt, God does these miraculous things, sends these plagues. They finally get free. They walk through the Red Sea. I don't know how many of you, how many of you have ever been in the middle of a sea that was parted? Any, I don't, any, any, nobody, okay. Because I haven't. But I tell you one thing, if I had been there, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you right now, I would have been like, in awe and like scared all at the same time but more than anything I would have been curious and so if I had could have just I would have gotten as close to one of those walls of water just to see if I could touch a whale that was coming by or like some, like one of those big fish or something like that you know am I the only one maybe I am it's the, it's it's the little boy in me I don't know but once God brought them through the Red Sea brings them on to the other side so now they're in the wilderness and now Moses is saying God I need you to show me what I need to do so then God calls him up on the mountain and he says I want to reveal myself to you and then it says in this verse Exodus 34 6 and the Lord passed before him Moses and proclaimed listen to what God proclaimed to Moses because of how vast and amazing and enormous and and beyond comprehension our God is this is what he says to him the Lord the Lord God merciful and gracious long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. He wanted Moses to know I am the merciful one and he wants us to know that he is long suffering and he abounds in goodness and in truth. Number three, he shows his virtue and his beneficence to us as our provider. Anybody ever had God provide for you? Philippians 4 19 and my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus and I am so thankful that that we live by that principle as we are a part of the kingdom when we tithe and we put God first it doesn't matter what the stock market's doing it doesn't matter what the economy is doing and people are wringing their hands and wondering oh no oh no what's going to happen with the Dow Jones and and all of that and it but when you are trusting in God my God shall supply all your needs all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus he shows us his virtue and his beneficence by being our way maker Isaiah 43 19 says God says behold you know when God says behold what that means Wake up and pay attention, right? Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness. In the wilderness. I don't know how many of you have ever been to a wilderness, but wildernesses do not come with roads in them. It's just a wilderness. It's barren. There's nothing. But he says, I want to make a road. In other words, I want to make a way through this difficulty and this challenge in your life. And I'm going to make rivers in the desert. Some of you know what a desert looks like and some of you don't, but you may have seen it on National Geographic like me. And deserts do not have rivers. But God says, I'm going to put a river in the desert. In other words, I'm going to do something new and don't put me in a box because I will continue to show myself over and over and over again. And you cannot put me in a box because boxes are for things. They are not for God. Amen. Amen. Side note, I know some people say, man, why does Pastor Curtis, PC, he keeps giving us all these scriptures. I can't keep up with all these scriptures. That's okay. I don't expect you to keep up with all of them. But the reason that I feel compelled and led to do so is because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord, according, according to Romans 10, 17. So when we've just got to get the word, we got to have the word. We got to know the word. And then once we know it, you know what? And we've got to hear it. And then we've got to say it. And Prophet Peter, we've got to pray it out loud. We got to say it and we got to pray it out loud. Because when you say it, guess what? You're hearing it. And when you hear it, faith comes. And you need faith to keep coming. Amen. That was a side note. You can take that, put it in your pocket and, and take it home.
Even in the book of Genesis, we're talking about that God is good and he does good, right? Even in the book of Genesis, it records that after each day God created something, God himself looked at it and said, that's good. That's good. So I believe, I believe you guys would allow me the opportunity to speak for all of us in this room and say after all of those verses and all of those scriptures that we've just read, that we can say we know God is good and that he does good. And I'll take it a little further by saying we know that from our own individual stories. I'm pausing for dramatic effect. No, I'm really pausing for you to, after I just said that, to start to think about your stories and to think about how many times in your life, I can think about how many times in my life that I've experienced the undeserved, the unmerited, and the unearned goodness of God. And if you wonder if you have received it at all, The fact that you're sitting in this building today, the fact that you're watching online proves that you have experienced the goodness of God. But now I want to ask you a question because now we've said we know, we know it from his word. We know it from our own lives that we know God is good and we know that God does good. But what do you and I say? When his goodness doesn't come the way we wanted it to. Do you and I still believe our God to be good and our God to do good when his goodness doesn't show up the way we hoped for? It's a great question. And as always, the Bible gives us an example of what that looks like, an example for us to understand it in our own lives. And I want to share just a little bit of this story about a man named Job. (laughs) Out of the book of Job, I know some of you, most of you, many of you have heard of Job, heard something about his story, and I'm just going to give a summary of it real quick with the few minutes that we have left together, but I encourage you, I encourage you to find the time to sit down and read through the book of Job. It will bless you. It will strengthen your faith. It'll even answer some questions for you about some things that have gone on or are going on in your life. So the Bible says that Job loved And feared God and feared him in a reverential way, a respectful way, a way of honor him and that God and that Job put God first in his family, first in his finances, first in his life. So much so that Job had seven sons and three daughters. And so oftentimes, as you know, kids do, they would get together and they would have these parties and and just having a good time together. But Job, he wanted God to be the center of their life so much that he would then go and make additional sacrifices to God on behalf of if his children perhaps may have sinned. He didn't want anything to stand in the way of God being center for his life and for his children's life. And I want to say this before we move to the next part of the story. Job was not only blessed to have 10 children, but Job was a very, 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 very wealthy man. Some years ago, I did a study on Job just to find out what, if they were to calculate his wealth as for today, what that would mean. And Job was so wealthy that they said if he were here today with the wealth that the Bible says he had back then, that he would be in the top five richest people in the world. That's how blessed he was because God had blessed Job. God continued to bless Job. So he had his children, he had his family, he had his wealth, and then catastrophe. And that is not an overstatement. Catastrophe hit Job's life. In a moment's notice, his 10 children were at the oldest brother's house 
having a good time and a wind comes and the roof of the house falls in and kills all of his children instantly. And then raiders from another country come in and destroy all of his flocks, all of his herds, everything. He loses everything. And then after that, Job is struck with boils. And I don't know if y'all know what those are, but boils are sores from the top of his head all the way down to his feet they would keep breaking out and as he of course is in mourning over all of this he then on top of the boils puts himself in sackcloth and ashes and the boils were so bad they were so so sore that he broke a pot and took the broken pieces and would scrape the boils off because that's really the only relief he could have only then for them to come right back again. And as any of us humans, which we all are, would do, Job cries out to God, and this is my summation of what he said, God, where are you? Where are you? What happened? How am I in the middle of all of this pain, of all of this suffering, of all of this grief? It would be hard enough to have to grieve the loss of one of my children, but all 10 at one time. God, where are you? What did I do? What have I done? What did I miss? I believe Job asked, Job asked some of those questions. But then what amazes me is while he's crying out like that, as we all would. Am I right? Can we be honest? We all would in a situation like that. But then on the other side, on the other side, the other part of what was deep, down in Job because he wasn't just making sacrifices because he was doing a checklist but he was in relationship with God then he makes in the middle of this devastating trial I can't even find the appropriate words to properly describe it but in this devastating trial he proclaims some faith filled truths like these Job 19:25 Job says, I know that my redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. Now get that. He will stand on the earth. As Job is going through all of these things, where is Job? He is on the, he is on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh... I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Now I got to tell you, I have been in the Christian walk in the Christian faith for some years now. And I've read that scripture and I've heard it quoted many times, but not until, um, the Lord gave me this for this sermon. Did I see this? That Job is saying, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end, the end of what? Of his trial, he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, here's the faith-filled statement. Yet in my flesh, I will see God. Now we know according to scripture, flesh doesn't go to heaven. Am I right? Am I, am I preaching it right? Flesh doesn't go to heaven. Our spirits go to heaven. But Job is saying right in the middle of all of this craziness and all of this suffering and after my skin may be destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. And then he goes on to say, I myself will see him. With my own eyes, I am not another. I believe Job was saying, and ain't none of y'all going to outlive me through this to then tell me what it was like to say, I will be there myself. This will not get the best of me. It is
is hard. It is challenging. It is difficult. But this is not my end. With my own eyes and not another, I will see him. Job 23.10. And again, you've got to remember, Job hasn't gotten on the other side of this thing yet. He's still right in the middle of it. And he says in Job 23, 10, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Come on, do you see that? That faith-filled statement there. Job was like, in this difficulty, oh, I, 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 I've suffered all of this loss and, I've, and my body is racked with pain with all these bulls, but I'm not giving up. I'm not going to give in because even though I may not understand this way that I'm on, I don't even know how I got to this part of the journey. Remember uh, Psalm 119, 68, God, Lord, he, you are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. Take me on the journey. Job's like, I don't even know how I got to this part of the journey. Uh -huh. But I do know this. He knows, he knows. Yeah. the way that I take. Oh, and when he has tested me, I won't just take my last breath and say, okay, but I will come forth, will come forth. as Woo. gold. <laughs> I am going through the process and I'm going to get to the end of this thing. And when I get to the end of it, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be stronger than I was before. So then I think the question merits being asked, did, had, had God turned away from Job? Can you imagine that Job probably felt that he did? Even Jesus, when he was on the cross, and suffering, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew that God hadn't forsaken him. But in his, I believe he said that for us so that when we are going through those times that make no sense and we don't even understand how we got there and where this even came from, that we could know that Jesus himself, Job himself, had to have felt like, God, have you turned away from me? Did God cease being good to Job? No, he didn't. And Job, like many of us, though, he didn't know the backstory to how he ended up to where he was and what was happening with him. And I want to share a little bit of that with you because so many times in our lives, we don't know the backstory. And when I say the backstory of what happened that preceded before this came. And so in Job chapter one, it says, uh, starting in verse six. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came along with them. And what I love about that verse is when the enemy tries to convince you and I that he's got all this power and he can wield and, and wield it and use it however he wants to. When God summons the sons of God, guess what? He's got to come to. Whenever God summons, he's got to bow and come to. He is still under the authority and the rule and the lordship of our God. Verse seven, and the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, I am roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And then God says of Job, for there is no one like him on, on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil then satan answered the lord does job fear god for nothing uh, have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side have you not blessed the work of his hands and increased his possessions over and over in the land and so then this this conversation this dialogue keeps happening with uh between god and with and satan and so satan is trying to say well if you remove all these things i know job won't serve you i know he'll turn away the only reason he's he's as dedicated to you you God as he is, is because you've blessed him with all these things and so God says okay I'll allow you to do these things I'll allow you to send the wind over the oldest brother's house that will make the roof crash in and kill 
Job's 10 children. I'll allow you to allow these raiders to come in and to take all of Job's wealth. I'll even allow you to strike his body with boils because God knew that Job would not turn his back on God. God knew Job's heart and he knew that no matter what Satan would be allowed to do, Job was not going to turn his back on God. And God was not going to turn his back on Job and God will not turn his back on you. And in the end, I'm going to skip to the end. I'm going to skip to the end of, of Job's story. God restored Job's life to be so much better than it was before. Through all of the hurt, through all the grief, through all the pain, through all the suffering, through all of him enduring. Ooh, his three friends. You got to read the story just to read that part. His three friends telling him that he just needed to confess whatever the sins were that he had committed. And if he would do that, then God would give him favor again and God would restore him, which, of course, we all know was completely not true but Job believed God I believe that Job believed God to be good and to do good and I'm going to tell you why that is because that's the only way in all of this that Job could say in Job 13 15 though he slay me yet will I hope in him yet will I hope in him as as uh I was preparing for this message and, and just going over it and going over the um, story of Job as just an example to us. And I thought, you know, I want to share just real quick, just some of some of of our story, mine and Charmaine's story of of the fact that God is good and he does good. And even though his goodness doesn't show up the way that we always want it to. And I remember early on um, when I started out as a worship pastor, when I was in my uh, early 20s, which was about five years ago. And, uh, <laughs> and I remember I worked at this, this particular church, right? And um, there was just this group of people there in uh, that church. I then found out later that they just had an issue and a problem with a lot of leadership in the church, but they did not like me at all. I mean, not, not oh, we don't really like him. Like they had disdain for me so much so that they got together. This is how wicked it was. They got together and made up these lies and these rumors to spread about me. And as the Bible says, their tongues set it ablaze. And y'all know as well as I do, because we're all human, we're going to keep it real. If the subject matter is hot enough, we're going to be like, well, what was it? Well, what'd they say? Is that what happened? Am I right? I know y'all quiet in here now. That's all right, because that's how we do. And so it just kept spreading and spreading and spreading and spreading. And I'm in my early 20s and, and just saying, God, what? And I felt like, like Job, not saying that that's anywhere close to what he went through, but I was like, God, what? Because how can you or I in ourselves, how are you going to chase down a rumor? How are you going to stop a lie? Boy, my, my Southern just came out right then, didn't it? Anyway, um, if you know how you, you can't, it, it's impossible. So I remember, and what, what brought it back to my memory, this was actually not one of the stories I was going to share, but I was looking through some scriptures, uh, last night and I was using this Bible and I found this one little part that I had highlighted and the Holy spirit reminded me, this was the very Bible that I was using at that time. And I had written, I just written down all these and highlighted all these scriptures, especially in the book of Psalms, when King David would talk about his enemies and he would, he would ask. God to just like demolish them, you know, just like step on their heads and just crush it into the concrete, like so much so that even the memory of them would be gone. And I'm telling you, when I would read that, ooh, my heart would start beating. I'm like, yes, God. Yes, Lord. That's my prayer. Lord, I'm praying just like King David. Lord, just abolish them. Just demolish them. Just pummel them. Just, just squeeze their heads between your fingers. That's what I wanted to see happen. That is what I wanted. That's just the truth. I wanted revenge because I knew that that was completely unjustified. It was a lie. And I wanted God to just show up, just strike them with lightning. And, then, and, and I wanted to see it. I didn't want to hear about it. I wanted to see it, right? Anybody ever been there, you know? Uh, <laughs> but, 
you know what? God didn't demolish those people. He didn't destroy those people. They went on to live their lives. But God was still good. And he still did good for me and to me. And even though his goodness didn't show up or pan out the way that I wanted to, listen to this, God let every word of those rumors and lies fall to the ground. He rendered them helpless and he continued to pour favor over my life and move me forward in his purpose. And what I love the most is what the devil meant for evil towards me. God turned it for my good. And I know you have your own stories of that as well. This beautiful lady right here that I just referenced earlier, my wife, Charmaine, and I have been so incredibly blessed to have five healthy, wonderful, beautiful kids. And we're so thankful for that. But do you know what? Over the course of time of having those five, we also had seven miscarriages. Why? I don't know why. Was God only good to us when we were able to complete the birth of the five? No. And we don't know why, and I don't know that we'll ever know why on this side. Charmaine and I have talked about it so many times. Why, 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 why? And we don't know why. We don't know why Charmaine had to deal with the angst and the, the, the fear of that and, and why she had to deal with the grief of that because while it was exciting, super exciting, every time we had one of the five that we have, yay, they're here, we got another, we got a boy, we got another boy, we got another boy, we got another boy, and then we've got a girl, right? Which was wonderful, but oh, uh, because we prayed the same prayer over all 12 pregnancies. God, we thank you for this child. Thank you for blessing our lives with this baby. Thank you that this baby's gonna be healthy and strong. And then when it didn't happen, was God not good? And then when we would have the one that did make it, it was super exciting, but at the same time, and I think, honey, you would agree with me, while we were so excited, there was also finally this sigh of, okay, this one made it. Because it was super exciting to have the five, but it was difficult because it was the same process. Oh, you're pregnant, oh yeah, and then, and then you, you, lose, you lose that one. And we don't understand that, but God was still good yes he was good because he gave us the five and we've got the seven that are in heaven that we cannot wait to get to see and I often think about it that you know that's 12 and then with me and Charmaine that's 14 and our house that we have here would not hold that however our mansion in heaven will be plenty big enough for all of us but I want to tell you I want to tell you even more so of how it is that God was good and he did good even in all of that, even in those seven miscarriages. Because before we got married, right before we got married, Charmaine was having her physicals and she went to have a doctor's exam that only, you know, you women have. And um, the doctor said to her, he said to her, listen, I'm not even going to, you don't have to worry about uh, using any sort of uh, birth control. Um, I'm not even going to prescribe any of that for you, even though you, I'm sure you guys will want to wait to have your children, but don't worry about it because there is no way, his words, there is no way that you can get pregnant. And if by some miracle you do get pregnant, that you won't bring the baby to full term. But how many do you know? That God has the final say. So the goodness of God, though it did not come the way we had wanted, but he still was good and he still did good. Amen. And those five are here 
today as a witness that God is good. So I want to say in closing um, today that to say this has been a hard, devastating, trying season that we've all been walking through for the last year and a half or so, collectively and individually, it, that's, that's not even really scratching the surface. And I know that so many of you, like Charmaine and I, have suffered the loss of friends and family, not just to COVID, but, but to, to many other things. And and when you and I are in those kinds of moments and we're in those seasons and, and we're navigating waters that we've never been in before, your mind, and especially the devil, will try and tell you that God doesn't care. I'm sure I'm not the only one in those times, in those moments, that's heard the enemy say, if God is so good, then why did this happen to you? And you know, the thing is, he, he's tricky and, he, and he, he's sneaky and he knows when to say those things at just the right time. Because one of the things that you and I struggle with is we, we will often equate how good God is or if God is good by if it feels good. And we can't go on our feelings. We can't trust our feelings. God gave us our emotions and I'm so thankful we worship him with our emotions. We live, we express who he is and what he means to us through our emotions, but we can't go on our feelings. And when the enemy tries to say those kinds of things, if God is good, then why did this happen to you? And you know what? I don't know. I don't know why God allows things, hard things, take your breath away, things, difficult things to come our way, but I do know this. His goodness is that he is there in every moment. In every moment. That's his goodness. And, and when our hearts are broken and our minds are devastated, that's when he holds us close. So when everything around you, everything around me seems to elude your grasp for help, please just remember this. Your God is a present help in your time of trouble. Your God knows the path that you are on because he's carrying you on it. Amen. Your God began this good work in you and he will be faithful to help you complete it. <laughs> Lastly, from his own words, he will never leave you, nor will he forsake you, but he will be with you until the end. Why? Because God is good and God does good. And he's a good, good father who loves you. And as, um, you know, you're walking this thing called life out, I just want to remind you of what Job said, Job 23.10, that he knows the way that I take. When I can't see my way clear, when I can't even understand how I'm here, I just steal myself with knowing that he knows the way that I take and he will be with me to the end because God is good and all the time. Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet today. 
And I want us just to, to end with having this, just a little time of worship and reminding ourselves again of how good God is. In all of our lives, he's been faithful. It doesn't mean it's been easy. It has not been easy. I don't know how many of you may or may not know of Prophet Peter's story, but he was sharing that with me some months ago. He literally is a miracle to be standing here today, and that was not easy. But you're here because God is faithful. And I, quite frankly, I'd rather have his faithfulness than just have it easy. Because as I'm walking with him in his faithfulness, and he's teaching me his statutes or his ways, then he reminds me over and over again that God is good and he does good. Amen. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so
Help us to remember that you are good. That you do good. You are good. That you do good. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Come on, everybody, raise your right hand with me as we make our declarations together today. Say, I am saved. I am healed. I am free. I have victory. God is on my side. God is good. And God does good in my life. In Jesus' name. Lord willing, we'll see you back next week. Be blessed in Jesus' name.